Today we're going to derive the coupling equations for the flow of a Newtonian linear viscous fluid. These equations are known as the Navier-Stokes equations and uh, perhaps the most important equations in fluid mechanics. So recall for a Newtonian linear viscous fluid that the stress Tij is proportional to the rate of deformation tensor dKl. And we can write that Tij equals minus P delta ij plus bijk times dkl, or substituting for the rate of deformation tensor in terms of the components of the velocity gradients, we have minus p delta ij plus one half bijkl times del vk del xl plus del vl del xk, where p is a function of density and temperature and the components of the fourth order viscosity tensor bijkl are also a function of density and temperature. If there's no flow, then the fluid at rest supports a hydrostatic pressure, P, and so the stress is just Tij equals minus P times delta Ij. Because this represents an extra unknown in the problem, an extra equation is required, and there are two uh, main cases. The first case is incompressibility, namely con the constraint that the density is constant which we've seen from mass conservation, gives us that the divergence of the velocity vector or the trace of the rate of deformation tensor is zero. Alternatively, if the fluid is compressible, then we need an equation of state, such as the ideal gas equation P equals rho R theta, where theta is the absolute temperature and R is the gas constant. We can show that a Newtonian fluid can only be isotropic, which simplifies the fourth order viscosity tensor down to two parameters, lambda and mu, such that bijkl equals lambda delta ij delta kl plus two mu delta ik delta jl. And then substituting this into our constitutive equation, we get that tij equals minus p plus lambda times dkk delta ij plus two mu dij, where mu is called the viscosity. Or in direct notation, t equals minus p plus lambda trace d all times i, plus 2 mu times d. For an incompressible Newtonian viscous fluid, this further simplifies, making use of the fact that div v or dkk equals zero. And so this term here disappears, and we're left with tij equals minus p delta ij plus 2 mu dij, or t equals minus p times i plus 2 mu times d. Now recall that the equations of motion uh, rho times the acceleration, uh, the material derivative of the velocity with respect to time, is equal to the divergence of the stress plus rho times the body force vector. In index notation, this will be rho dv j dt equals del tij del xi plus rho bj. And now substituting the expression for the stress from the equation for an isotropic incompressible Newtonian viscous fluid, this would be del del xi of minus p delta ij plus 2 mu dij plus rho bj, which is minus del p del xj, so minus del p del xi times delta ij is minus del p del xj, plus mu times del vi del xj plus del vj del xi, differentiated with respect to xi, plus the body force term which gives us minus del p del xj plus mu times del 2 vi del xi del xj plus del 2 vj del xi del xi plus rho bj. However, note that this term here is del del xj of del vi del xi, which is the divergence of v, which is zero for an incompressible fluid. So this term disappears, and the equations of motion simplify to rho dvj dt equals minus del p del xj plus mu times del 2 vj del xi del xi plus rho bj. So here they are again, and we can also write this in direct notation as rho dv dt, which expands to rho del v del t plus rho v dot grad v is equal to minus grad p plus mu Laplacian of V plus rho times B.
So these are the Navier-Stokes equations, and the terms represent, this term here is the transient inertial force, and this term here is called the convective inertial force. So these terms are both mass per unit volume times acceleration, but this is the acceleration as seen by a fixed Eulerian observer. This is the relative acceleration uh, as seen by the moving particles. So together, the net inertial force has these two terms, which we call the transient and convective inertial forces. Then we have a pressure gradient, uh, a term due to the viscosity, the viscous forces, and the body forces. So these are the five terms that constitute the Navier-Stokes equation, the conservation of linear momentum for a linear, isotropic, incompressible Newtonian fluid. If we write the Navier-Stokes equations out in full, using u, v, and w for the components of the velocity vector, and x, y, and z for the spatial coordinates, then the equations look like this. Del u del t plus mu du dx plus v du dy plus w du dz is equal to minus 1 upon rho dp dx plus mu upon rho del 2 u del x squared plus del 2 u del y squared plus del 2 u del z squared plus bx, where you can see we've divided through by rho in this form. Similarly, the second equation involves del v del t and derivatives of v with respect to x, y, and z, the pressure gradient with respect to y, and uh, Laplacian of the v component of the velocity vector plus the y component of the body force vector. And finally, in the z direction, del w del t plus these terms involving partial derivatives of w with respect to x, y, and z equals minus the pressure gradient in the z direction plus mu over rho times the Laplacian of the z component of the velocity. And in addition, we have the incompressibility equation uh, from conservation of mass gives us that del u del x plus del v del y plus del w del z equals zero. And we've already assumed this in the derivation of the equation, but we often need to use this condition to simplify the or constrain the flow field. So let's use the Navier-Stokes equations to derive the solution for a problem. And this problem is the flow of a fluid under the action of a pressure difference between two plates, two parallel plates. And this is referred to as channel flow. The plates are aligned parallel in the x direction, so the flow velocity u in the x direction should vary only as a function of y. And we have boundaries at y is equal to plus or minus a. Now, for the moment, we can't necessarily rule out the possibility that there's some y component of the velocity, but will allow that the u and possible uh, v velocity components can only vary as a function of y. In the third direction, nothing's happening, so we'll say that w equals zero. And we'll say that the flow is steady, meaning that the velocity is not changing as a function of time, so del v del t is equal to zero. The only body force here is the weight, and if this channel is horizontal, such that the vertical direction is y, then that means the only component of the body force uh, would be in the y direction. It would be negative downwards, representing gravity, so by would be minus g. Now the boundary conditions are that v at these boundaries, a and minus a, is zero because these are solid boundaries. No fluid can leak or flow across these boundaries. Because of the so-called no-slip boundary condition, which is an empirical observation in fluid mechanics that is found to work reliably, the x component of the velocity u is also zero at the boundaries. This is called the no-slip boundary condition. So u at a and minus a is zero. Now we can use incompressibility, which reduces to del v del y equals zero, 
which in turn implies that v equals constant, but since v equals zero on the boundaries, that means v is zero everywhere. And so now, without having to assume that there's no uh, y component of the velocity, we can actually use incompressibility to show that that's true, provided we allow that or stipulate that u and v were only functions of y. They weren't changing in the x direction, they weren't changing with time, and nothing is happening in the z direction. So now we can apply the Navier-Stokes equations, and if we take the x force balance equation, the x uh, component of the conservation of linear momentum, we have del u del t plus u del u del x plus v del u del y plus w del u del z is equal to minus 1 upon rho del p del x plus mu over rho del 2 u del x squared plus del 2 u del y squared plus del 2 u del z squared plus b x. Now, most of these terms are zero, as we've already seen. In fact, the only ones that we're left with, since v is zero here, so this term uh, is zero, uh, u is not a function of x, so del u del x is zero, the velocity is not a function of time, so this term's zero, nothing's happening in the z direction, so w is zero and del u del z is zero. There must be a pressure gradient del p del x that's driving the flow, but u is only a function of y, so the Laplacian reduces to del 2u del y squared. There's no body force in the x direction, and so we're left with just two terms in our governing equation. The pressure gradient term, dp dx, must equal the viscous force term, which is mu times Laplacian of u, or since u is only a function of y, that's u d2u dy squared. So now we're left with a second order ordinary differential equation to solve, and we have two boundary conditions, so we should be able to solve this. So integrating a second order differential equation, if d2u dy squared is a constant dp dx, then the u as a function of y must be a quadratic, and so we can write that u is equal to y squared over 2 mu dp dx, where dp dx again is a constant, plus an unknown constant b times y, plus another constant a. So we can now use the boundary conditions to solve for a and b. Now recall the boundary conditions are that y is equal to plus or minus a, u is zero. So that means that b must be zero here. And a turns out to be minus a squared over 2 mu dp dx so that when y is equal to a and minus a, these terms cancel out and we satisfy the no-flux boundary condition. And so therefore, the final solution is u equals 1 upon 2 mu times y squared minus a squared dp dx, which is a parabola, a parabolic flow profile that's maximum in the middle when y is equal to 0 and 0 on the boundaries when y is equal to plus or minus a. There are terms left in the y-force balance as well. We get dp dy is equal to rho g, or integrating this gives that the pressure p is equal to rho g y plus a constant that could potentially vary as a function of x if we prescribed it, so if we prescribed it that way. So that's the solution to this problem for the velocity u and the hydrostatic pressure p due to the weight of the fluid, where mu is the viscosity, y is the position across the width of the channel, and dp dx is the driving pressure gradient that's producing the flow. A similar solution exists for a circular tube, except that now we have to formulate the problem in polar coordinates, and for a tube of radius a, allow that the velocity in the x direction is a function of only the r radial coordinate. And so for this case, an axisymmetric flow in the x direction, the Navier-Stokes equations reduced to the Laplacian of u will become just 1 over r del del r times r del u del r, with no theta term here because of axisymmetry. And that is balanced by 1 over mu del p del x, again, the driving pressure gradient. So the only difference between this equation and the one we got before is that this is the 
Laplacian for the case of uh, polar coordinates with axisymmetry. This time the two boundary conditions are that u equals zero at r equals a on the boundary. And by symmetry, by axisymmetry, the velocity profile must have a maximum or minimum at r equals zero. So we have del u del r is equal to zero at the center line r equals zero. And so again, if we integrate this equation, uh, we get that u is equal to 1 over form u times a squared minus r squared del p del x, which is the same form of the parabolic flow profile that we derive for the channel, just with uh, a different coefficient here. And this kind of parabolic tube flow profile is called Hagen Poisseur flow, or commonly just Poisseur flow for short. And we can obtain some useful results from this equation. So this is the flow velocity. To get the flow rate, we would integrate that velocity over the cross section. So an integrate from r equals 0 to a of u times r times 2 pi. And the r here is because, uh, and 2 pi is because this integral would really be the integral from 0 to a with respect to r and 0 to 2 pi with respect to theta times r dr d theta. So that simplifies to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to a of u r dr, which gives us minus pi a to the fourth over 8 mu d p dx. So this is the relationship between the flow q and the driving pressure gradient del p del x. And you can see that there's a fourth order dependence on the radius of the, of the tube and an inverse uh, proportion to the viscosity. So the higher the viscosity for a given pressure gradient, the lower the flow. The higher the radius, the higher the flow, and that increases according to the fourth power. We can also use this solution to compute the stresses, specifically the shear stress solution. And so using the equation for a Newtonian viscous fluid, uh, for this flow where u is only a function of r, we get that trx, or tau, the shear stress, is mu del u del r, which is r upon 2 del p del x. So the shear stress is proportional to the driving pressure gradient and increases with the radius. From Poisseur's law, if we approximate the pressure gradient dp dx as delta p over L, then we can relate the flow to the pressure difference by a resistance, which is pi a to the fourth over 8 mu L. So this is analogous to the resistance in an electrical flow, where delta p is analogous to the voltage drop, and q is analogous to the current, and r is the resistance uh, which is 1 over this term here. So 8 mu L over pi A to the fourth is the resistance. Again, the resistance increases proportionately to the length of the tube and the viscosity of the fluid and uh, in inverse proportion to the diameter. So as the diameter gets smaller, the resistance increases uh, dramatically um, to the fourth power of the diameter. You also see that reducing viscosity would also reduce uh, resistance proportionately. And an example of this is what occurs in surgery when uh, blood gets replaced with some uh, fluid, so we get a hemodilution, and this is actually can be beneficial to maintain blood flow. Now there are limitations to the situations to which Poisseur's formula can be applied. Poisseur's flow is not valid at the entry to the tube before the flow has become laminar and steady. That's because at, at the beginning of the tube, uh, the flow takes a little while to become fully developed. And so u in this uh, entrance uh, condition is a function of x as well as y. And this is a consequence of uh, effects at the boundaries known as boundary layer effects. Another situation where Poisseur flow is not valid is when the velocity and diameters are high enough to produce turbulence. Reynolds, in the 19th century, did experiments 
trying to figure out at what flow conditions a laminar flow would become turbulent. And he discovered a parameter called the Reynolds number, which is dimensionless, where uh, the transition to turbulence would occur when this parameter was something in excess of 2,000, depending on, on other factors like the smoothness of the wall of the, of the tube. So the Reynolds number is defined as rho u d over mu. And this is a dimensionless quantity. Rho is the density. U is the characteristic velocity. D is the characteristic dimension, so the diameter of a tube in a tube flow. And mu is the viscosity. And this dimensionless number, as it gets larger, turbulence becomes more likely. And the point at which turbulence occurs is called the transitional Reynolds number. And in the circulation, uh, the Reynolds number varies from uh, 10, under 10 to the minus 3 to over 1,000, and there are some parts in the circulation where it exceeds 2,000, and 2,300 is the transitional Reynolds number for blood flow. So uh, in the heart and around the heart valves, the Reynolds number does exceed or can exceed 2,000, and it's possible to get turbulent flows there. So just to see what the Reynolds number means, it's useful to go back and look at the terms of the Navier-Stokes equations and to look at their dimensions. So if we let capital U be the characteristic velocity and L, we call it D in the last slide, to be the characteristic length, then we could write down the dimensions using these quantities of the different terms in the Navier-Stokes equation. For example, the convective inertial term would have units of rho times u times u over l. So with u our characteristic velocities, l is a characteristic length scale. So rho u squared over l is an order of magnitude estimate, if you like, of the convective inertial term. The viscous forces here would be proportional to mu times the second derivative of v with respect to x, so in other words, u mu times u over L squared. The Reynolds number is the ratio of these con inertial forces, convective inertial forces, to the viscous forces. So to see this, um, if we take rho u squared over L divided by mu u over L squared, we get rho mu L over mu, which is the Reynolds number. So for Reynolds numbers much larger than one, we can see that inertial forces dominate. And for Reynolds numbers much less than one, viscous forces dominate. So that tells us that, for example, uh, when the inertial forces become sufficiently high, turbulence can occur. And that when um, the velocities become slow and the uh, characteristic lengths, such as the diameter of the tube, become very small, then viscosity becomes dominant and the flow is laminar. So low Reynolds number is the situation for blood flow in the small vessels. High Reynolds number is the situation for blood flow in the largest vessels. So this is our brief introduction to the Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, we briefly derived solutions for two well-known problems, the channel flow and the closely related tube flow. And we saw that the Reynolds number was a measure of the ratio of the convective inertial forces to the viscous forces. Therefore, it's a dimensionless quantity, and it's useful, among other things, for uh, determining whether a flow may be close to turbulence. And we discussed how in the circulation, under most conditions, uh, the Reynolds number is below the transitional Reynolds number, and blood flow in most of the circulation is laminar.